Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Right, hi guys, and welcome to episode five of the Health Oddity podcast uh, with myself, uh, James St. Pierre, and uh, Peter Lant. If you'd like to say hello, hello, good, hello, <laughs> and Paul, and uh, and Paul Bassett. If you'd like to say hello, hello. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and today we're on. <laughs> it's always nice when people laugh at you after. First... <laughs> we, we're honoured today. We've got our very first uh, special guest. Now, our guest today uh, is Mike Sweeney. Now, Mike is a registered uh, dietitian who has worked uh, privately and uh, within the NHS as well. And he is also a, a research kind of focused uh, nutrition educator. And he works a lot within the fitness industry with gyms and personal trainers to help uh, educate instructors and trainers and he's also got a fantastic nutrition system uh, which helps uh, members of gyms and, and clients of trainers uh, with their nutrition education and planning and, and and with full disclosure both Peter Lan and myself have worked with uh, with Mike over the years uh, and 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 we've got a lot of benefit from working with him so that's why we thought it'd be great to bring him on the podcast today uh, to answer some questions and to have a discussion around nutrition, which obviously in the previous few episodes we've already said is a bit of a minefield and it's something that people get very passionate about and almost like a sort of a dogmatic uh, belief system, almost like, like we said, religion or politics, you know, uh, nutrition uh, is a very passionate subject for many. So uh, we're really looking forward to having Mike with us for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. So uh, hello, Mike. How's it going? <laughs> Hi, Mike. <laughs> up, Pete? Okay. So, uh, what we've done, I think, Pete, you've spoke to some 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 of your guys, and I'm sure, and I'm sure, uh, Paul, yourself as well. Uh, you know, with your with your uh, clients and members, uh, are regularly talking about nutrition and around nutrition as it fits in with exercise and lifestyle and all the rest of it. So, we thought we'd have a bit of a free flowing conversation and drop in some questions. That we've been asked as well um so i don't know pete do you want to do you want to first of all sort of kick it off and, and yeah i'll and, go uh, ahead because i asked the, i asked some about. of my guys in um in one of the whatsapp groups that i've got for my um for my online stuff and they came back with the things that we've spoke about before, Mike. So we spoke about this before we started recording, and Mike said he, he was dealing with this like six, seven years ago, and it's the same questions. Um, you know, why am I not losing weight? Okay, I'm sticking to my calories and I'm not losing weight. Why, um, why do apps tell me I need 3,400 3, calories when I'm eating 2,200 and not losing weight? Um, you know, um, what's the difference between protein, fat, and carbs, veggies, and fruit, and how much of each should I be eating? It doesn't matter how many carbs I eat and all of this stuff, you know. Um, and then eating less carbs, eating less sugar, eating fresh, eating more protein, etc., etc. Is any one of these right? Is everyone different, or is moderation the only real answer? And they're all pretty much the same question, right? You know, it's... That's the way I see it anyway. I don't know. We'll, we'll see Mike's take on it. What do you reckon? <laughs> no, no, so it's, a, it's actually a good starting point, right? Because, like, obviously, there's a bajillion questions there. But for me, at this point in the game, like, I've been in the fitness industry now over 10 years, um, you know, being a dietitian for five years. Um, and so for me, all those types of questions <clears throat> just sum up for me the state of the fitness industry as a whole. Like it's not a reflection of the people that have asked those questions because very rightly, like the fitness industry is a confusing place. Like I work mostly with trainers these days. You know, I've done my time working with clients, as James said, privately in the NHS um, and, you know, like with sports teams and all different types of clients. So I work mostly with trainers now. And it's funny because trainers have the same level of confusion as the clients. 
So all of those questions, I've also been asked those by trainers. Um, and like I said, for me, it just reflects the state of the fitness industry. Um, and again, it doesn't reflect on the individuals asking the questions, but more so the industry. So, you know, the industry is just continuing to put out confusing messages, conflicting messages. And I think, you know, as we talked about before, you guys hit the record button. Like for me, like the fitness industry, it's kind of like a love hate thing because on the one hand you see it with all of this, like just burning with potential, right? It could literally change the world. It's one of the biggest industries on the planet yet it's failing, like, like ridiculously failing. Um, and part of that is, you know, we've got every man and his dog in the fitness industry promoting their own little thing because everybody needs to make money. So you got one guy saying keto is the only way, paleo is the only way, like, it, you know, carbs make you fat, no fat makes you fat, like all of these different things, vegan, protein, all of that kind of stuff. And I think that's where all the confusion comes from because it's very easy to look authoritative on the internet. Um, you know, pretty much anybody can do it. You can say anything. Um, not to go on a tangent, but like <clears throat> for me, that's also one of the things about the internet. Like the amazing thing about the internet is anybody can publish anything. And the worst thing about the internet is anything, anybody can publish anything. <laughs> um, we spoke about yeah, that, it's... didn't we? When we first had a chat about everyone is an expert and how do you differentiate between the caliber yeah. of the information? And that's kind of why we've got this podcast is, it's not, it's not necessarily to set ourselves as experts, but to always ask the questions to get you curious about how you explore the information out there. And I suppose that's why we've got you on there, on here, Mike, is because it, it is very difficult to evaluate whether or not someone who says 800 calories is the way to lose weight versus someone who's saying you need to eat 3,400 versus all the other information out there. Or should you track run to lose weight? And before you know it, you're very, very confused. And every trainer has their niche. We all have our niches and with our expertise. And, and we, and there's that classic phrase, if everything's, uh, if all you've got is a hammer, everything's a nail. And so speaking to you is for me, it's going to be very interesting to see kind of how you evaluate the quality of the information that's out. Yeah, I was that's also going to say, point, Mike, actually. as well, just, just quickly, Mike, I was going to say, do you think it's actually the state of the fitness industry or the state of kind of, because on TV, there's obviously so many different programs on, you know, almost every other week you've got, you know, either Michael Mosley or someone else coming on or, uh, you know, you know, eat, eat well to lose weight, whatever these different programs are. And it's, and it's kind of almost like in the in media and society in general, you know, newspapers, magazines, TV, internet, fitness industry, there's so much conflicting information that people almost get bombarded from, from all, all sides, don't they? Yeah, hundred percent. So when I, for me, when I say the fitness industry, I include all of that. So all the different types of media. So we've got the internet, we've, like you said, TV, radio, we've got books, you've got people like Michael Mosley, who is a doctor and has some obviously credibility as a medical doctor, like no qualifications or anything as a nutritionist. That doesn't mean you can't learn obviously, but um, so yeah, when I say the fitness industry, I just include all of that, like this big umbrella term. Um, and like the internet, I think just exaggerates everything. Um, but even before the internet, you know, like the fitness industry is one of the few industries where you can like, it's a bit like life coaching, you know, you can just wake up one day and say, Hey, I'm a trainer. You can write a book. Um, and in fact, I won't mention his name, but there was a guy that did this about five years ago. He basically wrote a fitness book before he finished his sports science degree, published it, it became a national bestseller. Um, obviously, for a very short time, he got rich and famous. Um, you know, and that was somebody that was still studying, like hadn't worked with anybody ever. Um, so it's one of those industries where you can just wake up and be like, hey, look, I'm a trainer, say some stuff. Um, you know, and everybody's trying to learn, but everybody's also trying to make a living. So, you know, I'm not sure anybody sets out to purposefully deceive people, uh, but we just have this weird thing of like everybody saying different stuff, <coughs> basically just because they want to seem different. They want to, you know, have the scarcity mindset. They want to get all the clients. They need to make money. Um, and yeah, like very few people take the time to get up to speed before they enter the industry as a business 
I, I suppose the question then becomes, given that we can be sidetracked by the questions of specifics, i.e. how many calories should I eat, whether, you know, is a banana good for you, or whatever it is, how do we then evaluate what an expert is? Who should we be listening to? Because then in a way, regardless of the information out there, the, the funnel for the conduit for that information has got to be trusted. So how do we evaluate the conduit for the information? What, what sets a, someone who is trustworthy apart from someone who is a chancer or, you know, like you, you can have two, two people who both look very fit and healthy. Mm. Which one do you trust to give you the information? You know, and how do we, what is an expert? I don't know. What is an expert in fitness? The chubby think? one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, and so for me, two things pop up into my mind straight off the bat. Um, and one of those things comes from, as Pete mentioned, I used to have a podcast about six, seven years ago. It might even be longer than that now. Um, and on that podcast uh, with a friend of mine, we interviewed all of the researchers, you know, they, they like, protein metabolism researchers and all different types of nutrition type researchers. And we, because for us, like, like I did a sports science degree, I did a master's in dietetics. So for me, everything starts with the research, right? Like you don't just come up with an idea. It's like, if you have an idea, oh, I think this, what, what does the research say? And then, you know, go from there, try it out with clients or whatever. So it all starts with that. So we viewed the researchers as experts, right? And we would get those guys on our podcast. Um, and be a bit like, oh, I can't, like, can't believe you came on a podcast type of thing. But the amazing thing about that experience was that even though these guys, you could argue, like, are at the forefront of doing all the research and they've read all the research and they arguably know everything, they were the ones coming on the podcast and be like, hey, listen, um, like, I researched this topic. However, like, there's loads we don't know. I don't know everything. Um, and I always remember that. And for me, that's kind of like everybody I've ever met that is really good at what they do, whether that be nutrition, whether that be fitness, whether that be just business, like other stuff, the people that are like really good at what they do, um, are not afraid to say that they don't know everything. Yeah. Um, and they definitely don't come across with like absolutes, you know? So we, we all see Facebook ads. That's like keto is the only way to lose weight. Da, da, da. Like, you know, so, and that's just a marketing gimmick. Like you read enough marketing psychology books and you realize that what people want to buy is certainty. So you have these kind of like fake gurus, if you like, giving out that message of certainty. Like, look, keto is the only way it's keto or nothing. Like your life's over. If you don't do this, like you will absolutely get shredded in the next three days. If you do my keto diet thing, like, so on some level, that's what we all want in our life is certainty. So uh, the marketers know that, so they use that to their advantage. Um, so, so that would be one of the things for me that pops up is like, you know, if somebody's spouting their method as like the only way, like the absolute best way for me, they're either just a good marketer and, and by a good marketer, like, don't get me wrong. I don't think deceiving people is good, but understanding how people work and using that to your advantage to elicit change, hopefully. Like, that's what I mean by good marketer. So, um, so there's that. And I can't actually remember what the other thing was now, but it'll come back to me in a sec. <laughs> now, I suppose going back to what you were saying, Mike, that, that, or what we all said was that it's a very confusing kind of topic and there's so much conflicting information out there. If someone does come out and appear to have, you know, the one way and it's very simple, that's probably why it's very appealing, isn't it? Because it kind of, it clears all that confusion. If you just decide to, to have that one approach and follow it and you, you believe hand on your heart, that's the, the way it's going to be. Um, it, that's probably why people buy it, isn't it? Because it, it, it kind of promises to, to get rid of all the confusion and give you clarity and give you certainty and, and all the stuff you said. 100%. Yeah. Like I said, you can read a hundred marketing psychology books, you know, books by people like Robert Cialdini, Dan Kennedy, all these types of guys. So like psychology is probably like my second uh, love, if you like. I just read psychology books for fun because I find it fascinating. Um, and yeah, all of those marketing psychology books, that's what they say. Like people on some level, whether they realize it or not, they want certainty in their life because, you know, we live in a world of chaos, unfortunately. Um, and so 
have uncertainty. Um, yeah, like people will pay for that. That's what they want. And like I said, as a marketer, like, you know, when you're promoting to people, um, you want to give off that air of certainty. I do think there's a way to do it without, um, you know, pretending like yours is the only way. I think that's what a lot of these like sub niches, if you like, like keto and paleo, I think that's for me, that's what they do wrong. Not that they need any help because they're already big enough, but um, you know, they all pretend like theirs is the only path to go on. Uh, and it's definitely not, I would personally much prefer it if they were like, look, like we do low carb because for some people it's just easier. If you like eating meat and salty and fatty things, low carb is probably going to be easy to stick to. It's not the only way, but it's the way that we do it over here and we get good results. If people said that, I don't think people would be half as confused because like what Pete's saying, like, well, what's the difference between protein, carbs, fats, and like none of that would matter if the supposed gurus were saying those kinds of things because then people would realize, well, vegan is not the only way, it's a way. How about I try it for three weeks? Ah, I didn't stick to it because I was hungry. Okay, let's try this other way. Like they just intuitively then know that there are multiple ways um, and there are multiple ways like we can get into into this really because um, yeah. I suppose we sometimes- There's, there's an interesting thing there. There's an interesting thing there about saying, like people who say my way is the only way, right? And this, I've just learned something there, by the way, because I have people coming to me, you know, who've been working with me for a while. And I, I've seen this thing on the keto diet. Should I try it? And I just said, no, because you haven't, you haven't used the nutrition system that we use, that, that you built, Mike, and all that. And I'm like, it's very simple, mm. you know, calorie target, protein target. Well, that's probably wrong. I should say, yeah, go ahead. Go and try it. And they might love it. So they might do the exercises at my exercise program that I give them and that we've worked on and all that, but they might go and do the keto diet and it works wonders for them, hmm. you know, and then it'd be like, right, brilliant. Or they might go, well, I tried that and it was a nightmare and I hated it. And I'm like, right. So now we know, now we know. So let's try something else. Let's, let's take a different approach. So there is the way of saying my way is the only way, but there's also ways of saying you don't want to do that way because, because I don't like it, but it doesn't matter if I like it or not. It's whether the person likes it. Right. So, some people might throw yeah. What do you reckon about that? Yeah. Well, for me, as you're talking there, like this is where like, and it's really hard to do as a coach because all of us on this call, we do what we do because we really want to see people change for the better, right? And it's really hard to stay impartial to that when you can see somebody going down a path that you're like, ah, they're going to mess this up or, or what, derail themselves or whatever. But it's really important to keep your coaching head on, I think. So if somebody comes to me now and is like, you know, cause I've been coaching for so many years, the default thing is like, okay, you want to try a keto diet. Explain to me why you want to try that. Mm. Oh, because you know, X, Y, Z. Okay. Anything else? And just try to fish out their own reasons. So I was reminded of this recently where I was reading a book on persuasion. Um, it's all about like interpersonal persuasion. Uh, basically, you know, how to communicate your ideas so that like people actually, you know, listen to them and take them on board. Because the reality is if you tell people what to do or what to think, then they won't do it. And we, we're seeing this right now with the whole coronavirus thing. Boris is like, you got to stay in and you got to like, don't go to the pub after 10 p.m. and only six people. Right. And then in the same breath, they're like, well, if you don't do it, we're going to fine you 10 grand. Well, why is there a fine? Because they know people aren't going to do it. Like, you know, we've had. 70 years of public health campaigns telling us what to do and how to live like eat more vegetables do we eat more vegetables no because nobody wants to be told what to do can i find um, my clients ten thousand pounds <laughs> yeah let's do that <laughs> that's a good business <laughs> it might lose <laughs> yeah so so anyway in this in this persuasion book i was just reminded of the fact that like People do things for their own reasons, right? And our job as a coach is to help them discover those reasons, whatever they are. And sometimes they don't have reasons and they've got to discover that for themselves. Um, so yeah, when, whenever somebody comes to me these days with like, oh, like, what do you think about this? Or what do you think, what about that diet? What about that diet? I'll first ask them like, oh, well, what do you think about it? What have you read? Um, mm. You know, you tell me what you think. And then you can normally go from there um, and, and build upon that. Um, so that's, that's just the way I would approach it. And just to circle back, um, to the question about how do you differentiate an expert and a non-expert? So the, the second thing for me is to do with research again, 
but it's this thing in like, so the fitness industry has become really good at appearing credible. And these days, pretty much anybody can say like, oh, hey, like low carb diets are best. I've got this study over here where people lost like an extra two pounds in a month. So that proves that low carb is the best. Um, and that for me is like a marker of somebody who's not what you would consider like a true expert, um, like a true scientist would look at all of the research, you know? So for me, as James and Pete will know, like when I say anything, um, like in any of my courses or anything that I've delivered over the years, I can point to like one of like 30, 40, 50 research papers to be like, look, look at the pattern across all of these papers. Like you tell me what the pattern is and it's, you know, and, and that's why to be fair, like, like I, like James and I think Pete has done the nutrition course that I used to promote years ago. Like there isn't much in there. <laughs> And there isn't much in there because like when you look at the research, it's like, yeah, like when you boil it all down, like there isn't actually very much. Like that's, it's quite simple. That's one of the problems with this stuff. You, you buy a course or you buy training or you buy something and you're expecting all of this stuff. And then someone goes, right, just do this. And you're like, well, and that costs like 200 quid. And you're like, yes, because you're going to go and spend thousands of pounds on doing the wrong, like, well, not doing the wrong thing, but doing things that don't work when just try this. And it's like, well, mm. done. There you go. And well, you're exactly you, buy a coach, you buy accountability as much as anything. Exactly. And Mike, we were, talk we were talking about this just before we started recording as well. Tell us what you said about Socrates, about that thing, about how little you need to know. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting because it's obviously like totally disconnected from the podcast in a sense. Uh, so I was just reading a philosophy book this morning. So I read a lot of stoicism, um, just helps to keep me mentally on track amidst the chaos, I guess. Um, and there was this quote from Socrates from around 350 BC, where Socrates, not in the words I'm going to say it, because I obviously use more modern everyday um, travel language, you could say, um, <laughs> where Socrates probably spoke a bit better than me. Um, but basically, he said that anything that makes you feel like you want to eat or drink, like past the point of being thirsty or hungry, in his opinion, would be a very bad thing. Like you, you want to el eliminate that from your life. That's more or less what he said in this book. And I thought it was really interesting because I knew I was going to speak to you guys today. And I read that and paused and was like, oh, that's really interesting because Socrates knew that you know, in 350 BC, since then, we've had thousands of years of, you know, lots of different humans trying out lots of different stuff. And we've had about 70 years of hardcore scientific research. And they've looked at everything like ketogenic diets, paleo diets, low carb diets, liquid diets, solid food diets, clean diets, flexible diets, like pescatarian, all of the Etarian variations. <laughs> um, there's new ones coming out all of the time. I can't even keep up. Um, and basically what they all show, like all of the research shows is that he was right. <laughs> like he was fundamentally right. And it's just, as we were talking about before, like, it's just really bizarre that, you know, like, or maybe it's not bizarre when you take into account like human nature, I guess, like our default mode is uh, maybe to overcomplicate things. And maybe that's partially why it happens along with all the other stuff that we talked about. But yeah, Socrates had it right way back then. Um, all the research has proven that to be right. Um, Given that there's all this information, what every, the, the thing on everyone's lips is going to be, what do I do? Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. It's, it's sometimes, I mean, I'll sit here and I have my thoughts on that, but but given mm. that you've looked at the research paper, given that you've worked with trainers, given that you... Uh, have probably had your own personal experiences. How, how do you marry all that information, all that confusion, also all that research, which research is great, but we don't carry around a, a massive book of research papers with us, and certainly as trainers, and individuals, mm -hmm. they don't have the time. How have you condensed that down to provide the best rules of thumb for someone to get lean and have a healthy life? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's two sides to this that I want to tackle. Um, I'll answer your question directly first. And then there's the second side, which is actually more important, I think. Um, well, not I think, I know. 
Um, I like that. Keep them waiting. Keep them waiting for the more important. <laughs> I like that. That's good. That. <laughs> <laughs> we end the podcast here. That's the psychology <laughs> marketing <laughs> side. Keep them listening. You. <laughs> so, in terms of like, what do I do? Right, like the actual doing of the thing. So, the best way I can explain this is. <clears throat> Like Elon Musk has probably made popular the whole approach of first principles. Um, and it's kind of like how I, for me at least, and I know other scientists kind of approach it in a similar way, um, but it's how I've always approached science, um, even though until recently I wouldn't have described it as first principles because I didn't really know what that was. Um, but basically the first principles thing is just, you just keep drilling down until you can't drill down anymore, right? You just get to the fundamental core concept. So the famous example from Elon Musk is he wanted to start a rocket company. Turns out it costs about $65 million to buy a rocket and obviously he couldn't afford it. So he decided to do some digging, like how do you make a rocket? Well, it's made out of this and it's made out of that. Did it? And he just broke it down, right? Like down to the core principles. Um, and he worked out that he could build a rocket for about a million dollars if he built it himself. Just with scraps of metal, nuts, bolts, like rocket engines, etc. And that's how he started SpaceX for like 65 times cheaper than it should have cost. Um, because he just broke it down until it couldn't be broke down anymore. And then just built a rocket. I think he blew the first one up or something crazy like that. And just gone from there. And that's kind of like how <clears throat> I've always approached science, not necessarily just nutrition, but science. Um, and, and that's how I would answer your questions. Like, how do you make sense of all this research and all the theories? Well, you just keep breaking it down until it can't be broken down anymore, right? So we can look at a research paper or hundreds of research papers. Ketogenic diets definitely work and they definitely do. There's some upsides to it. Okay, cool. Like paleo diet in terms of weight loss definitely works. Like there's some upsides to that. Like low carb, it definitely works. Like Liquid diets, like you could just drink like, um, you know, like a protein shake with some sugar and some essential fats in there. Just do that four times a day. Like that will absolutely work. How do I know? Because there's research demonstrating that works. Like, and so when you look at like, okay, what's the fundamental core principle behind all of that? Well, energy restriction. That's the thing that all of these research papers have in common. Okay, cool. Let's run with that. So when you look at research on energy restriction, and all of the research on that shows that basically when people eat more than they need, they gain weight or weight loss stops. The more you decrease your calories, you lose weight faster, but you hit a plateau. And so there's really nowhere to go from that, right? Like, and that's why people like me will say like, oh, like it absolutely is about calories in, calories out. And don't get me wrong, there are things that influence things that make that either hard to um, be consistent or a bit more tricky. Like a lot of people like to point to hormones and stuff and those do have an impact. However, even if you have low testosterone, if you consistently eat less calories than you need, you will lose body fat. Absolutely categorically will be the thing. And here's the example I used to give to my patients in the NHS. This might sound a bit harsh, but I actually did say this to people uh, and it just got the point across really quick. So if you read any books about Auschwitz, <clears throat> you know, the prisoner of war camp, uh, they very sadly obviously put like a lot of people into these camps and basically fed them bread and water. I think bread, water and soup, like two or three times a day. Um, and obviously, you know, very sad and very tragic. Um, but the interesting thing with that is like nobody came out from those camps overweight. Like nobody. So if calories in, calories out wasn't the thing and it was, you know, because of insulin or it was because of low testosterone or high growth hormone or, or any other peripheral thing that influences calories in, calories out, but doesn't determine like the ultimate outcome, um, then that wouldn't have happened. You would have had some overweight people, some thin people, some underweight people, et cetera. But most, you know, a lot of people sadly died because of starvation. But, you know, before that, you know, they did lose a, a ridiculous amount of weight. Um, and again, it's, it's quite a sad and harsh way to put it. Um, but yeah, it just kind of demonstrates the point or gets it across, I guess, that like, once you've drilled all these theories down to the calorie level, like there's nowhere to go from there.
Um, and so that's like a first principle. And so once you understand that, then the question becomes not so much what do I do, but like, how do I do this? So how do I consistently eat less calories than I need? Okay, well, what are the obstacles to that? If somebody's like, like me, I like to eat large amount of food, like large amounts of food, especially in the evening. So I'm hungry a lot. Um, so for me, I just focus on, I just ramp up my protein intake. You know, that fills me up, that gets rid of the snacky cravings and, and that works for me. Some, some other people might not struggle so much with hunger. It might be more of an emotional thing, et cetera. But then you can already see as a coach, we go from like, well, what do I do? Well, that's not r the real question really because you, know, you, you drill it down to the, the first principle and then it's like, okay, how are we going to tackle this? And this is where it starts to get like, maybe slightly different for different people. Um, and a good coach will understand how, how all of the diet methodologies work and be able to pick and choose dependent on the person. Um, if, if that makes sense. So dependent on what they struggle with, like somebody might not struggle with hunger and might not necessarily like meat, you know? So for that person, mm -hmm. maybe a vegan or vegetarian approach, maybe they just feel great and, like, that's fine. As long as they're consistently eating less calories than they need, um, they're going to lose weight. Um, mm. You know, health, you know, health is a different topic. I know people like to lump both together and you can absolutely become healthy by losing weight. However, eating for weight loss and eating for health are two totally different things. Um, so, yeah, we'll maybe not get into the, the health debate so much, I guess, but I was actually, I'd made some notes before coming on with you, Mike, and I think that's, you just touched on something which I think would probably be good uh, to almost do a separate podcast down the line in a, in a couple of months or whatever is because ultimately it does come, weight, weight loss and weight and maintenance comes down to like, you know, the energy balance equation and calories in, calories out, doesn't it? As you just said, yep. but then kind of optimal health is different to, to 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 weight loss in in many ways so because like you say we you could you could eat a mars bar for breakfast lunch and dinner and you would lose weight you wouldn't necessarily yes. be be healthy so maybe that's a that's probably i mean th these broad topics are brilliant to talk about today but maybe we could have a have a follow-up one down the line where where we maybe talk more about health as well because i think what you've said already um it is certain it is it is giving certainty and it is giving clarity but it's like you say it's breaking it down to that principle level so people can now see so i think from what peter said earlier and i'm sure what paul what you know from experience as well is that when when most people come to you and say oh i tried that but it didn't work what happens mo what, what they mean most of the time is i tried it but i couldn't stick to it or i didn't it didn't work for me because i couldn't do it because like you say if people stick, it's a phrase, isn't it? The best diet is the one that you can stick to and the one that you can, you can do for the rest of your life. You know, and like you said, high protein works for you. Um, and it's finding something that people can adhere to. And I know that adherence and kind of habits and, you know, lifestyle change is something that you massively go into as well, isn't it? It is absolutely. And, and that kind of started my fascination off with psychology uh, and brings me round to what I think is the, the, the most important question um, that should really come before the what do I do? Um, even, even if you take into account everything that we've, we've just said and you start off with like, okay, how am I going to do this calorie restriction thing? Even before that, the most in question, uh, most in question, most important question um, that I've come to realize is like, why bother? And it sounds like a strange question, but I think most people are running around trying to achieve outcomes that they're not particularly bothered about. Mm -hmm. We live in, sadly, I think, and I'm going to get very philosophical here for a moment, but I think we live in a very egotistical driven society. Everybody wants the 2.4 children, the car, the body, like the money and all of this kind of stuff. Not very many people are pausing for a second and asking themselves, why do I want that? You know, and don't get me wrong, like I struggle with this all of the time, which is why I love to read philosophy books and I journal and I'm questioning myself all the time. I went through this about four years ago, where I just really had this like deep desire to buy like a brand new Audi or a Mercedes or something. <laughs> and I, 
on, it sounds daft, but like I just like I just really wanted it. But then like just through the process of journaling, I just realized like why did like why I wanted that car or a, a new car like that was because then I knew that people would think more of me and I wanted them to think more of me. And I got to that conclusion just through asking myself, well, okay, you want this new car? Like, why do you want this new car? Like, what's, go what's it going to do for your life? And it took a while. And once I realized what the real thing was, like, it wasn't that I wanted it. It was that I wanted other people to think more of me. And then mm -hmm. I realized like, oh, hang on a minute, like that's a bit daft, right? Because the important people in my life already think, you know, good things about me. And like, that's enough. Uh, and this applies to dieting psychology, which is why I think like, why bother is the very first question. Um, you know, most people these days, they want to lose weight because they think they should, you know, everybody's I, joining. Go on. Yeah. I was going to say that makes perfect sense. Cause coming back to the, like I said, I asked my guys in a WhatsApp group, any questions for Mike? And they came, they came with all of those questions, which we've all heard before and we've all answered a million times. But then the conversation went later on. They all started talking to each other in the group and it all went to, I eat when I'm stressed. Um, I've got a love-hate relationship with food. Um, I eat because I'm just, I'm just greedy. You know, all of this. And one of the people in there had come to me last week or the week before. I need to set some new goals. It was like, okay. And the goal was to lose a stone. And I was like, why do you want to lose a stone? You've already lost three stone. Why do you want to lose another stone? It, it, you've lost three stone and that hasn't made you put you where you want to be. So why would losing another stone make you happier and that's where they went away and, and I said go in think about it more and we'll, we'll talk about it and ask a lot of questions and then they come back and was like right it's my relationship with food it's things that have happened to me in the past it's all of this other stuff that I need to sort out and that'll get me that thing but it'll sort a lot of other stuff out as well um let me explain yeah there was so, so I was to say um, we, we're very focused on the external right and I always yeah, yeah. I always uh, come back to this but there are internal things that we have to have in place and it's one of the reasons you talked about reading stoicism it's one of the reasons we talked about our value system in the first podcast there are internal dialogues that we need to have in order to even know what to do with the external I know it sounds like some Buddhist thing but but <laughs> it comes back not so. we've got to do some serious thinking about our value system and why we're doing things because I've worked with a couple of clients recently who've got astonishing results because they've made a massive, massive internal commitment for whatever reason, but they have geared everything around themselves to make something work. And they've done it under stressful circumstances and they've done it. And it's quite amazing to see that level of focus, but it's come through them doing some internal work, not me telling them what the best macro split is. Because I can give that to anyone, but not everyone runs with it. And that's where absolutely, absolutely yeah. Absolutely. That's where this goal setting thing. So we spoke about goal setting on the last um on the last episode, actually, on episode four. And that was what came out of it, because people think, right, I need this goal and it needs to be tangible and all that. But actually, if you've just got a process that you can follow consistently for a while, you'll get the thing anyway, regardless of having a solid goal. And then even just setting a solid goal can be stressful for people. So if you can start following a process, then you can start putting things to it and saying, right now I want this, now I want this and start to have those goals, but you've got to get a process in place first. And that's where this comes from of getting the internal process in place first to then be able to have external goals. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You're both right. Like every trainer wants the dream client that just comes in and smashes it. Like, <laughs> like the two people you just mentioned. So, you know, like if Anthony Joshua walked in this room right now and he's like, Mike, what do I do? And I tell him what to do. He goes away and gets shredded or gets massive or whatever. I'm going to look like a genius. But the reality is like, he's already motivated. He already knows why he's going to follow that plan. Right? Like, he wants to be undisputed heavyweight world champ. Like he wants that so deeply. He will do anything to get that. And this reminds me of a quote by um, another philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche. I think that's how you say it. Um, and it was something like, this is like from decades ago as well. Uh, but the quote was something like, he who has a why can bear any how, something like that. And again, it's just another example of like ancient philosophers or not so ancient in his case, but like, you know, old time philosophers, who had just already figured things out um, like, and, and you know, this is like what we're talking about. And to give you a, like a more modern real life example. So I had a client a few years ago, he was a trainer, came to me, 
you know, runs like quite a big gym franchise. Um, and he just felt really self-conscious because he was himself overweight and didn't really know what to do. And he just dove straight into like a new plan, a new plan, a new plan, a new plan. And he just bounced around like eight different plans in a year. And so he gets on the phone with me and I'm like, okay, mate, so you tell me what you need. And he's like, Mike, I just need to know what to do. And I'm like, whoa, okay, let's back up a minute. Like, like how does being overweight affect your life right now? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, something made you want to change because you keep chasing new plans. So explain to me, like, you know, in terms of like your work, your family life, like your relationships, like all these different areas of your life, like, how does being overweight affect your life? You know, and he started with work and it was like, well, you know, I feel ashamed and I don't talk to my clients and I try to stay hidden in the back and I let my staff members run the gym and, and like that. And then after about 10, 15 minutes of conversation, he, he, he started talking about his daughter and he was like, my daughter's five and I've never taken a swim in. I was like, oh, why haven't you taken a swim in? He's like, because I feel really self-conscious because I'm overweight. And I was like, write that down for me right now. Um, and honestly, this is, some people might not believe this. That was the only conversation I had with that client. He was a client for like six months. That was the only conversation I had with that client. After that conversation, I never had to talk to him ever again. The guy lost like, like multiple sums. And he's now like, obviously still a trainer, still running his gyms, but he's now, you know, in his gear, out in front of the clients, like confident, et cetera, et cetera. That was the only conversation I had with him just connecting the dots on like, why bother? Um, you know, and it, it kind of relates to what Pete said in terms of like, yeah, like set goals and stuff. Like for me as a coach, I go one step before that. So it's like, okay, cool. Like let's, before we set any goals, um, you know, what exactly do you want in your life? And this can be maybe an easier way to answer the question, well, why bother? You know, um, it's like, well, what exactly do you want your life to look like? And again, this is one of those questions that most people struggle with because most people don't slow down enough to think about this uh, and don't get me wrong this is not me putting myself on a pedestal like I talk so confidently about all the psychology stuff one because I read all this stuff and two because I have my own internal demons um, going on and you know there's a story that comes with that um, if you want me to go into that but yeah I was just asking yourself like what exactly do you want your life to look like you know and then once you've got that and I think people will be surprised, you know, like if they answer it honestly and not from a place of ego, like not from a place of like, oh, James has a massive gym that's been going successfully for 16 years. So I better open a gym. Why not? Meh. You know, like if I answer my that question for me, like and it's just for me, then it's like, you know, it's just going to look radically, radically different. And then once you know exactly what you want it to look like then you can start to feed out like, well, okay, well, why bother? Or in the case of the story I just told, like for that train, I just needed to connect the dots and like, look, like you're not like showing up in your daughter's life like you want to. So the next time you want to nail that packet of hobnobs, I want you to think about your daughter, like look at your daughter. If you still want the hobnobs, that's totally cool. But, you know, and, that, and that's all I think for a lot of people, if they start there, that's why like in the all the adherence training, the psychology stuff that I've, you know, try to teach to the trainers over the years, as James mentioned. That's why like most of that, I'm sure most trainers just like don't pay attention to the first section because it's a bit boring, all this stuff that we're talking about. But the first section is the most important bit, which is like, get your clients to understand like, why? Like, why are you bothering? Because if somebody's like, well, my doctor said I should lose weight. All right, cool. Like, like if I had a fitness business these days and I have had my own fitness business online, uh, which I don't anymore. But if I did, if a client came to me and said something like that these days, I'd be like, right, you go home. You have a thing about that for a week. And if you can't come back to me with, um, you know, something other than that, then we're probably not going to work together because of, like, as you guys know, like that's not going to go very well. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah. Exactly. Usually it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I paid for it. So. Well, there is that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, actually, because we're like, like, you know, we like to keep these to about 40 minutes. But, Mike, if you're up for it, we'll definitely get you back on. Because um, there's loads, you know, you've done loads on this stuff. You, you, you know, you've done loads of this stuff. So all the psychology behind it, 
as you know, this was meant to be, we were going to talk about nutrition and we've just talked about the psychology behind what we do in the beginning. Mm. And if I was you, by the way, I would have like, in the way I do things, I'd have probably told that guy to just sit around the house and some budgie smugglers. <laughs> and, then, and then see if he wanted to eat the packet of hobnobs. But anyway, you know, that's how, that's how it goes. Conventional. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and next yeah. time, and next time, Michael have to tell us the story that he that he sort of teased when he said, you know, the underlying stuff from himself, you know. So next time we can talk about that as well. And uh, that's and, that's going to take and, an yeah. extra long episode, I reckon, because I know some. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and and the uh, and the optimal health type stuff, because I mean, think I think today, I mean, it's been fascinating. I mean, I've absolutely loved talking to Mike today, and. Uh, you know, and getting that kind of insight in the stuff that we all try and do with clients anyway, digging in for the whys and finding out the, the, the kind of internal motivations. Because when we spoke about the goals, when we said most people come to you and, and if they want to, if, if you kind of try and force them to set a goal, they tend to just say something that they think that they think you want to hear. You know what I mean? That, that's mm -hmm. kind of the way most people work, isn't it? They kind of give you the answer they think you want. Whereas making it far more internal and far more personal and far deeper um, is, is, is the way to, you know, to get permanent change and, and make a real difference in people's lives, which I know is what all four of us uh, are after doing. So, uh, no, it's been amazing speaking to you, Mike. Thank you. Likewise, yeah, happy to come on any time. So, yeah, I could talk about this stuff all day, as you can tell. Yeah, um, yeah, no, we'll, so, def yeah, we'll just, definitely, uh, definitely get you back just on. Just let me know some dates and times. We can, we can do it. Absolutely. Sure. You want to wrap up, Pete? Well, why not? It's not that cold, but anyway. <laughs> See what I did there. Finish, finish with a joke. That's what it is. Anyway, <laughs> right. James, say goodbye. Goodbye. Paul, say goodbye. Goodbye. Mike, say goodbye for now, and we'll have you back on. Bye for now. We'll do this again. Excellent. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you all. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.